today I'll be talking to you about lessons learned building a reusable component library. Um, and as mentioned before, some of you may know me from my blog where I've been writing about Vue for just over a year now. Uh, on there I have articles ranging from beginners, um, getting started with Vue, all the way up to architecture, best practices, and different patterns you can use with Vue. I also have a newsletter on there, um, so if you're interested in some weekly insights, uh, I, I usually write a little bit less formally on there. It's um, less of a filter, so there's some interesting things on there as well. Um, I live in Waterloo, as mentioned earlier, uh, with my wife and our cute little dog. Um, we've had her for just about a year now. And she doesn't know how to pose for pictures very well yet, but we're working on that. I work at a startup in Waterloo called Vidyard. We build a video management platform for businesses. Um, and I do mostly front-end development there, but um, a little bit of back-end every now and then. And we use Vue, uh, if you haven't noticed by what I'm wearing. Uh, <laughs> We really like it, and we've uh, gotten a lot of use out of it. So this talk, I will be first going over Construction Yard, um, giving you a bit of an overview of what that is. It's our reusable library that we use at, at Vidyard. Then I will be going through the three phases of development that we've gone through as we've been building this out over the last year and a half. And as, um, as I share those phases, um, discussing some of the different lessons that we've learned along the way. And then if there's time at the end, I will be sharing some insights that we've found um, on how we've actually used these components in our application. Um, and before I go on, I, want to, I do want to make it clear that I'm not an expert on component libraries. We've only built one of these, and so um, instead of being uh, prescriptive best practices, this is, um, this is our story. And so hopefully you find some value in that. So Construction Yard. Construction Yard is a component library. And um, as Philip was mentioning yesterday, it's part of a design system. So you have the style guide that the designers work on. And once they've been, uh, once they're finished, figuring out the vision and how everything should look and feel, then it's our job as developers to take that vision and implement it into code. One of the, the major benefits that most of you are probably aware of is that a component library uh, makes development a lot more productive because instead of having to develop these things over and over again, you're able to just pull in a new component or um, several components and get started right away. Um, but something that we didn't realize early on is that it's actually helpful for designers and QA as well. Our designers are designing new interfaces um, in this component-based way as well. So instead of building everything from scratch, they're also putting components together and, and when they're working on new features. And similarly with QA, they know that once they've tested a feature and they've, um, they've ensured that it's accessible and that it meets our standards, that they don't have to test it ever again. And when they come to a new feature, they can just make sure that all of the different components are working together correctly and that they're hooked up in the right way. And something that I uh, only realized a couple weeks ago is that um, not just leveraging time, but we're actually able to leverage expertise on our team. So many of the developers at our, on our team are more comfortable on the back end, and the, uh, working with CSS is not their cup of tea, and so they don't have to work with CSS. They can leave that to me and some of the others that are on our team that actually enjoy deal dealing with CSS and figuring out those things. And so um, it's really a great way to, to allow uh, people who don't have those, those same skills to 
still be productive on the front end. So this is just a, an overview of some of the different components that we have. Um, pretty typical kind of things. We have um, everything from the basic interactions, uh, buttons and inputs and checkboxes and all of that, to more, more complicated things um, like menus and date pickers. Um, but interestingly, we also have some very domain-specific components. So you'll notice in the top right, we have uh, components for video thumbnails because we're a video management platform. Most of the, the features in our platform deal with videos in some way, and so we have lots of thumbnails that we need to display. And so something like this isn't available off the shelf, and so we have to uh, build that for ourselves. Um, this is just a screenshot of one of, the, one of the screens that we have, just to see Construction Yard in a bit more context. Uh, and here's another one. All right, so the three different phases that we have. The first one is incubation. So at the beginning, we only had a few different components. Um, we had maybe a button, maybe an input component. Um, but because we only had a few components, it wasn't really all that useful. So we weren't able to build anything useful with this, with this component library. We were building it um, alongside all of our regular feature work. And one of the more important things to note about this phase is that we didn't have an official project dedicated to this. We didn't have a team of developers on this component library. We didn't even have a single person whose job was to work on this. We were trying to find time in between our regular feature work in order to get this done. And that's the first lesson that we learned, is that a component library should be a happy byproduct of building your application. And what I mean by this is that instead of uh, building this on the side or dedicating a huge chunk of time to it as its own thing, you should be delivering the, the business value that you're supposed to be delivering as your main job, but doing it in such a way that at the end of that process or during that process, you are adding to your component library and incrementally improving that library. For example, a couple months ago, I shipped this feature where um, it allows a user to embed a video into an email or onto a website. And a couple weeks after this went live, my product manager came to me and asked me to um, make it so that our analytics software could track what the users were doing on this. So I had to go into our tabs component and modify it so that each tab had its own unique ID. And once I had shipped that, it delivered the business value that we needed. My product manager was happy. But at the same time, we made Construction Yard just a little bit better. And so this is a very agile, um, very incremental and iterative approach. Um, if you if you do the, the opposite approach that we had tried at the beginning of dedicating specific blocks of time to it, that's um, going more in the direction of a waterfall process. And um, as an industry, we've, we're trying to get away from that for uh, many reasons. So the second phase that we came to was this phase of adoption. So, this big spike that we have uh, actually happened at the beginning of 2019. And um, to give more context into why we have that, it's we, we started off this, this big project to completely rewrite our front end from jQuery and Bootstrap 
into Vue. And that big spike is when we got a whole ton of developers on this project all at once. And so as these developers were working on different features and converting them over to using Vue and converting them over to using Construction Yard, our component library, they were finding gaps where the, they didn't have components that they needed. And so as previously mentioned um, with lesson number one, as they found that they needed new components, they were adding them to the library. But because they were adding them so quickly, uh, we, we had some issues with trying to move fast without breaking things. Um, because as we were building new components, we wanted to make sure that the way we built those components was done properly. Because once a component is in your application, and it's been being used 100 or 200 times, it's really hard to go back and change what you did. And so a mistake early on has this huge ripple effect. As well, breaking changes were actually compounding on each other. And this is partly to do with the fact that, as with any new project, uh, at the very beginning, it's quite volatile. We're still trying to figure out uh, what, what we want to do with it and where to go. And we haven't found our rhythm yet. But because we have so many developers on such a small surface area, when we broke something, um, then it was really easy to end up breaking it again. So for example, if we have developer one, they need an input component for this feature they're working on. So they go to their library and they add in this input component. And now that it's in our component library, they can go back and go back to the application and add it a few more times. And they continue to develop this feature. And as they're working on it, developer number two comes along. It turns out that they also need an input component. But what they need is something quite different. And to make the changes to the in input component, they'll actually have to break it. And normally, making a breaking change is fine. We do this all the time in software. If you break something, you just go back and you fix it. But the problem here is that developer number one is still actively working on this feature. And so developer number two can't exactly go in and work on this code and fix it up. Uh, what's more is that by the time they would have fixed uh, this stuff that they had broken, there might have been a third developer breaking, uh, breaking this component yet again. And all of this came up simply because we were moving so quickly and we had so many developers working on it all at once. Um, and in, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have that many developers, but because of the business goals that we had, that, that was what we were given. And so we had to figure out a way to deal with it. So the solution that we ended up with was this. So, Developer number one adds an input component, and then they keep developing. Developer number two comes along, and instead of breaking the first component, they simply add in a duplicate component. And so instead of having one input component, now we have two components side by side. And so both developers can keep working on their, their respective features. They can keep working without being blocked by anything. And everyone is happy. But to be honest, the solution is kind of stupid. <laughs> Actually, when this was first proposed to, to our team, I was very against it because it's not elegant. 
It's, it's not nice, but it works. <laughs> and so that was the second lesson that we learned, in that sometimes the best practice is not actually what you should be doing, and that rules are made to be broken. So, moving on to phase three, which is where we find ourselves now. This is the boring phase, the phase where things are a little easier. So a couple weeks ago, I realized that we had done 23 patch releases in a row. No new features, no new components. Um, and so I realized, oh, hey, we're, we're in this period of of relative stabilization now, at least compared to this crazy spike that we had before. We have most of the components that we need now to kick off a new feature. We don't have to spend all this time building new components. We can get going pretty quickly. And most of the code that we're, we're committing now is cleaning up tech debt. And in hindsight, um, going through what we've gone through in the past year or two, we've come to the realization that you shouldn't build components in isolation. Now, when we first started, this was actually the approach that I advocated for. Um, but I've done a 180 on this. So we have, our, in our component library, we have a lifestyle guide where you have all the documentation and you can see the component rendered live. And so the approach that I advocated for was to build those components in that documentation because that would allow us to think more abstract and to build a component that's more reusable and not build it to a specific use case. Um, but what we found was that we ended up building components that we didn't need. We built components that only worked in our style guide and that didn't actually work once we started to use them in the application. Um, but most importantly, we found that we built components that were just kind of weird to work with, um, that once we actually started to use them in, an, in, in our application and work with them for real, they, they just didn't work the way that you would have expected. Maybe uh, we passed in an array and we should have used an object instead. Uh, and different things like that based on um, different props that we should have maybe done differently. And so now we're following this approach um, called the rule of three, which um, is a fairly well-known uh, best practice from the that's well known in, in software engineering where you wait until you've done something three times and at that point, then you make the abstraction. And this prevents you from creating abstractions too early for things that you don't need, as well as creating abstractions for things that um, you may not even, uh, for use cases that you may not even need them for. And so once we find that we've done something at least three times in our application, then that becomes a good candidate to pull it back into our component library. And so the next steps for us are to continue refactoring tech debt, improving documentation, um, because it is quite lacking, lots of tests, uh, and of course, looking forward to view three, as I'm sure all of you are. So I'm going to wrap up with some of the some usage insights that we found. So we have a tool that every time our application is built, it tallies up how many times each component is used in the application. And this is extremely useful um, in seeing what's going on. Um, it also tracks every single file that's being used, that it's being used in. So if you were 
looking to make a breaking change or looking to see how a component was used, you can um, follow the link and it will just link out straight to our GitHub. And so this is a chart of all of the, the data that we've collected. Um, this is only a couple weeks old now, but if you're familiar at all with the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle, this curve follows that almost exactly. The top nine out of 50 components that we have here make up 80% of our component usage. What's also interesting on the other end of the graph is that we have 10 components that aren't being used at all. So why are they in there? Uh, and this is a question that I've been asking myself over the past couple of weeks. <laughs> Some of them uh, we built thinking we were going to use them and didn't. Um, some of them, like this menu component, was being used only a couple months ago, but at some point, during some refactor, um, it must have been removed. And so that's something that's interesting, and so I'll have to investigate that further and see what's going on there. So because you can't actually read that graph, um, here are the top components that we have. Nothing too surprising, some basic interaction elements, um, yeah. So in summary, the three phases that we went through are in the wrong order here. <laughs> Incubation, then adoption, then stabilization. Lesson number one that we learned is that our component library should be a happy byproduct of our regular feature work, the things that our bosses and managers are telling us to do. Number two, that sometimes we should just ignore the best practice and do what's simple and what works. And that building components in isolation can work, but sometimes it's dangerous to do so. And you can find me online, michaelantison.com, and also on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you.